Thank you and a very warm welcome today for joining us, all those who are joining us for this event, Innovations and Mobile Banking in Africa. I'm Nicola Pogson and I'm Director of Alumni Rel Relations at Imperial College. Now we know that uh, alumni and friends in the Imperial community really value exposure to thought leadership and insights from Imperial and from our global community. So this event shines a light on the innovations of alumni and our invited guest expert working on the mobile banking and digital transformation sectors. And it also provides a platform to share knowledge, ideas and opportunities for careers and startups in Africa. And we're really excited. We have a very global audience, as you could already see for people sharing in the chat there. Uh, we have uh, over 30 countries represented from across Africa, Europe, South America, Asia, and the US, and graduating years spanning from 1976 up to current students. So just a very, very big welcome to all of you. And we're also just delighted to welcome the attaches joining us from across London's African embassies and to other leaders of mobile and challenger banks across the world. We're looking forward to hearing from all of you in the Q&A session later on. So I'm now very, very happy to be uh, welcoming Chris Tucci, Professor Chris Tucci, our event chair today. Uh, big welcome, Chris. Um, Chris is joining us from Imperial College Business School, and he teaches courses in design thinking, digital strategy, innovation management. His primary area of interest is in how firms make transitions to new business models, technologies and organizational forms. And I know he has some very interesting questions to put to our panel today. We're very lucky to have been able to grab him and uh, have his time. He's the perfect facilitator. Over to you, Chris. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, uh, we're going to have a look at mobile banking and financial services innovation in Africa uh, through the lens of some movers and shakers uh, in the fintech world. So um, uh, my name is Chris Tucci, as, as Nicola pointed out, um, and I am Professor of Digital Strategy and Innovation, Imperial College Business School. I'm also working on launching a new center called the Center for Digital Transformation. And I've been creating some new executive certificate courses, including one that actually starts today called Digital Transformation, Five Game-Changing Technologies for Business. <laughs> um, first off, let's acknowledge that Africa is huge. <laughs> you know, it's a diverse, dynamic continent. We can't hope to represent the entire breadth, you know, in one panel. Still, uh, there's a lot going on there. You know, Africa is the world leading continent and mobile banking was 180 million accounts. For example, um, COVID-19 is presenting many challenges and opportunities in mobile banking and digital transformation of financial services. So, uh, you know, we hope this panel gives you kind of a snapshot into some of the exciting things happening in Africa and uh, in, this, in the FinTech space and maybe inspires some of you to jump in uh, yourselves. Let me, um, let me start with a brief poll here just to get your, just to get your attention. Um, let's try this one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch the poll. And um, the question is, how much trust do you currently place in digital banking solutions? This is just for curiosity, for fun. So uh, you know, the first one is, I don't, forget it. I only bank at high street banks with brick and mortar branches. The second one, I divide up my money across digital uh, and traditional banks. And the third one is cord cutter. Most, if not all of my liquid assets are in digital banks. Well, let's just take a couple seconds here to get your, <laughs> see how many we've got. We've got 38. Up to 43 people, probably that's probably about as good as it gets right now. Um, let me stop this poll. And I don't know if you can see the results here. Let me try pushing the button, uh, share the results. Um, so it looks like uh, dividing up the money is, uh, you know, is the majority of 72% of you actually divide up your money across digital and, and traditional banking. Um, and then the rest are divided about equally 
between only high street brick and mortar and only uh, digital. So um, thanks a lot for that for that poll. We're gonna I'll maybe do one more later on. Um, what we're gonna do now is I am going to introduce our um, fantastic panel. So um, what I'm gonna do so so you can see the the, the speakers. Um, I'm gonna introduce each one one at a time, and then I'm gonna ask them to talk for a, uh, for a few minutes about uh, their trajectory and what they did, um, how they got to their current position, how their university experience contributed to where they are now. And then I'm gonna come back around and ask them for a current challenge they're working on, exciting and challenging issues. And then we'll have time to ask each other questions and we're reserving a good amount of time uh, for questions from the audience, discussion with the audience. Okay, so um, um, let me start with Natalie Jabangwe, um, the CEO of EcoCash in Zimbabwe. Um, Nat has over 11 years experience in financial services and technology, including five years experience with NCR Corporation, uh, the world's largest provider of fintech solutions to the retail banking industry. And she was also promoted to develop NCR's position in mobile financial services across 52 different markets, uh, reporting to the board uh, via direct reporting line to the chief technology officer. She um, is a graduate of Imperial College. She has an executive MBA in 2012, during which time she was working on a near field communication centric mobile wallet proposition featured at the London Olympics business program. And she has other degrees from Oxford and Middlesex University. And now she's the CEO of EcoCash Zimbabwe. So welcome, Nat. Thank you, Chris. Absolute pleasure to be here. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about your trajectory, uh, things that you found useful from, from your um, being an, EP, um, an Imperial College uh, alumnus, alumna, um, how you got where you are, and anything else you want to share. Awesome. Um, I think I actually decided to do an executive MBA at a time where my career was shifting and turning around. I was a senior software engineer at NCR and I was really sick and tired of coding and engineering uh, cash machines. And I just actually set up a flagship project and done the architecture for Metro Bank, which is the corner bank and led the team that did the architecture for that bank. And I really thought um, we were on the cusp of uh, digitization globally. It was the advent of Facebook, Twitter, and I thought not sitting on the engineering, but actually sitting on the business side of things would be more valuable for my career. And I remember my boss at the time encouraging me to do an MBA and I looked across, I was going to go to Judge Business School and then I wound up going um, coming to Imperial College London Business School because of the uh, science and the tech centricity uh, of the institution and I think I made a very good decision and while I was there my electives were actually specialization in high tech strategy and corporate turnaround and the IED innovation entrepreneurship and design course had just been introduced and I remember it was led by um, someone who was just like you uh, my professor Tucci who was Butlerice who was sitting at the European Commission um, of innovation in Brussels and he was also my uh, uh, thesis supervisor and my thesis was actually a comparative study on mobile financial services and how to turn around incumbent firms into highly entrepreneurial innovative firms and as a result of that work and my EID project I was working on a near field communication project payments wallet it was quite early but great insights went on to transform digitization in NCR where we did the first acquisition for NCR in digital 650 million acquisition of Retalix and our first partnership with PayPal and then I got headhunted for a job in Africa we'll talk a little bit more about that but that's so far as my journey uh, went and it all started during my executive MBA. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to our second panelist, Ngozi Dozier. Uh, he's the co-founder of Carbon in Nigeria. Um, he, uh, Carbon's a leading digital finance platform. In April 2016, ignited consumer finance revolution in Nigeria, which is one of the most promising and challenging markets in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, with the launch of the Carbon app that uses machine learning to score so-called thin file customers. In other words, customers with little or no credit history in real time. 
So Carbon's a fast-growing business, well-funded. They've raised $20 million in equity and debt in Series A. Uh, they have 95 employees spread between Lagos, London, and Palo Alto. And uh, Ngozi is a graduate of Imperial College London. He has a bachelor's in physics, and he has other degrees from the Wharton School and from Oxford. So welcome. Thank you very much. Um, good to be good to be here. Thanks for the invitation, and good to be back at Imperial College. Um, <laughs> The, um, so, so I did a BSc in, in physics, um, but my professionally, I, I went into finance, so accounting, banking, and so physics didn't really help. Um, it was useful in getting people to believe that maybe I was intelligent, um, but uh, it, it didn't really help. And then ultimately stayed in finance. And if I'd known what I'd known, you know, with the onset of data science right now, um, that physics does help in giving me that scientific background for some of the machine learning investigations we're doing as part of our um, um, carbon. But the, you know, in terms of background, I actually worked with um, another brother for about four or five years um, doing distressed investing across, across Africa. And, you know, the more we tried to find companies to invest in, the more we realized that the big opportunity that nobody was doing at the time, this is, this is pre-2012, um, was consumer finance. Um, and so the more we looked, the more we, we thought, look, there's a huge opportunity. The, the big banks are not really interested right now. And so we actually decided to set up Carbon. Um, it was called One Credit at the time, which, and the goal was to provide you know, financial services and more for, you know, for the un, underbanked. And the underbanked are a lot. Um, so that, that's us. Um, I'd love to talk more with yourself and the other panelists as we progress. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you kindly. Um, and now let's move on to Uzoma Dozier, who's the chief sparkler at Sparkle in Nigeria. Um, he's an experienced financial advisor and entrepreneur at heart who believes in technology and the African spirit. And he's worked in key segments of business development, corporate banking, commercial banking, and retail banking. He's a strong advocate of financial inclusion uh, and he's currently on the board of Women's World Banking, and he's the former CEO of Diamond Bank. So it's always been his priority to ensure that women in the workplace get the same opportunities as men. Uh, Uzoma earned his MBA from Imperial College Business School, and he has other degrees from University College London and the University of Reading. So welcome, Uzoma. Oh, thank you very much, Britt. Thanks for having me here. And um, it's, wow, it's like, close to 20 years since I did my MBA at uh, Imperial. And to, I mean, uh, now, how has that helped me? I think it, it started helping me only a few years, like only a couple of years ago, um, when, you know, like work that we did in terms of, in, 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 I know that one course that Imperial did then, started then was entrepreneurship, which, you know, I didn't pay much attention to right now. So I wish I could have those notes now. <laughs> which we were really digital then so i would all, all i had to do was actually just type in um, entrepreneurship but i mean along the way i mean those 22 in those 20 years um i worked at, at diamond bank for 20 years before i became before i left at md and one of the I, one of the um, benefits was that um, i never saw myself as a banker i saw myself as you know using diamond bank as a platform to drive um drive change and impact especially in areas like retail so we we transformed Diamond Bank from a commercial to a retail bank. And to do that, we actually had to um, leverage on technology. So every year when it was new technology, so I remember when we started and it was like branch banking, then was ATM, then was card. And then we now we moved to mobile. In fact, when we left, we probably had more mobile customers than any other bank in, in Nigeria. Now, so that helped. So in starting um, Sparkle, which we did, which we, which we started this year, I mean, it took us like a year to build it. The solution. I think we took the learnings from traditional banking and and then leverage on technology to unshackle ourselves from the the constraints of a traditional banking, which is you know, central infrastructure, even the culture as well. So just getting people and how do we leverage on artificial intelligence now to um, not only scale, especially where we're trying to scale services and products for millions of Nigerians who who, who don't have access to support services, but also how do we, how we democratize some of these services that were probably the privilege of a few. And so, that, so that's what we're trying to do at Sparkle, um, playing, a, playing a role in transforming how we can use um, technology and platforms 
you know, to really um, develop uh, people and businesses in Nigeria. Perfect. Thank you kindly. And now um, our last panelist is Stone Atwine. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of Eversend, uh, which is based in France. Um, he cut his teeth in fintech with Pretoria-based loan management vendor Payment Solutions International before consulting for multiple banks like Stanbic Bank, Barclays Bank, Standard Chartered Bank in Kenya and Uganda on using technology to improve loan collections. He's also co-founded Yetu Credit Finance and UserRemit.com used in Uganda, Kenya and Rwanda. Uh, he's a four-time laureate of the Paris-based Institut Choiseul as, as one of the young African leaders who has had a uh, major impact on the continent's economic development. And in 2017, he was selected by the government of France as an exceptionally talented entrepreneur, and he moved to Paris to found Eversend, which is Africa's first neobank. Uh, he's a degree in computer science from Barara University of Science and Technology. And we first met at the Lyft conference in Geneva, and we also interviewed Stone for my uh, MOOC for my massive open online course on entrepreneurship way back in 2015. So good to see you again and welcome. Good to see you. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Yeah. So I guess I'll just uh, jump straight into uh, that was a very comprehensive introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump straight into uh, school and uh, you know how university helped me. I think the main thing has been uh, uh, around. So I, I studied uh, computer science and um, uh, that uh, apart from meeting interesting people at, at university, um, basically how to think uh, about complex problems uh, that has been uh, i think uh, extremely interesting and uh, obviously having uh, gone into uh, computing and computer science uh, it's taught me how to uh, think through problems around you know programming how to deal with coders i didn't end up becoming a computer programmer but uh, i have to work with a lot of, so of software developers and that helps uh, that helps a lot it was it's 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 very different uh, i think that th these days you know you can get online and do like a, a mooc and uh, kind of pick up <laughs> a lot of uh, pick up a lot of um, programming skills uh, in our time that's something that you basically go out of um, university and uh, that was uh, super super critical uh, for me and uh, how uh, I've, 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 I've developed and, and, and how I think about uh, the challenges that um, we face. Fine. Thank you very much. So let me um, let me go back around the table once more time and ask you um, to uh, tell us a little bit about a current um, uh, current problem, current challenge, something that you're very excited about. Uh, why don't we start with you, Nat? And um, Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and what is something that is very exciting or challenging for you. Great, thanks very much, Chris, um, for that question. I'm currently the CEO of um, EcoCash, which is the largest joined the firm when it was only uh, 1.5 million customers. And um, nine years later, the platform's got 11 million users and we drive 80% of Zimbabwe's uh, GDP. We're bigger than all the banks in Zimbabwe put together. Um, it's, it's a surreal place to be in. When we started building up this business, all we were really angling for was an IPO on the local Bose, so 100 million uh, in terms of revenue. And now specifically going for million customers by the time 300 million and what has been 10 percent financial inclusion traditional banks in a hundred years have not done what we did in the shortest possible time so you can imagine very typical of digitized businesses if you look across think regulation inside. And with COVID-19 pandemic and most countries looking inwardly, we found that um, our government has really started to look at monopoly-like businesses. New regulation uh, has come through for us. We've been asked to close down our agents 
and a payments wallet have been asked to choose one. And these are when you're building for scale, sometimes you don't actually think what the end in sight will be and what it means if you're going to become really big. Google's face these problems in Brussels with the European um, Mark Zuckerberg found himself in Senate time after again, markets on account of regulation. So this is the new biggest challenge. What loses me tonight is that we're not sleeping on account of um, regulation. How do we save the core? And even though we've been so successful regulators. Yeah. So that's about it at the moment. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. You, you broke. I think you broke up. Hopefully, I, I, actually, I don't know if it's better or worse. Um, maybe it's better if I if I'm breaking up and I and <laughs> but I think you were breaking up a little bit there uh, towards the end. Um, but thank you very much for that. We'll come back to that um, in a minute. Um, let's let me ask uh, Ngozi uh, to to comment. Yeah, thank you. So the um, you know we, we call the brand carbon because you know carbon is fundamental to human life. It's it's found everywhere and it's also very flexible and that, and that's our promise to our customers. Um, trying to execute on that promise, um, I think the two challenges that we're facing right now. One is um, building the trust amongst customers to see us as their their main banking relationship. Um, you know, with the move to digital banking, you know, everybody hates their bank um, because of the friction, fees, etc. But they also trust their banks because over the years they've spent lots of money building building that brand. The branches actually give that sense of security, etc. So one of the challenges is is trying to um, get your typical consumer to say, um, despite the, the fact that, you know, I don't see you anywhere, I only see you digitally, I'm actually willing to um, give the, the bulk of my, my salary fund savings, savings to you. That, that's one challenge. I think the second challenge is, um, you know, we're trying to become a bank for Africans on the continent and in diaspora. Um, so whilst we started in Nigeria, we've got operations in, in Kenya and, and just recently Ghana. And taking that platform and trying to provide the same level of, of service, trust, et cetera, in different markets, you need to really respect you know, the local dynamics and the, and the cultural differences. And, and, and it, it's one thing to say, you know, transfer from A to B, but every, every market is different in what, what's acceptable, what, what seems trustworthy or not. And so those are the two challenges. It's really all about, you know, um, providing that global service, you know, in a manner that's local and, and trustworthy. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to Uzoma now. Okay, so, um, well, besides having, um, Ingozi has a competition and a lot of <laughs> banks spring, springing up in Nigeria, in, in Nigeria. I mean, I mean, Af this is Africa, so Africa has a lot of problems. And in Nigeria, Nigeria is a big land mass with 200 million people with different infrastructural problems, with different cultural, with different languages. So, you know, to scale with these different um, factors is a challenge in itself. And so it is, where do you start? Where do you create that critical mass? But beyond even all that, when you're looking at, the, I mean, for me, it is always going to be, how do you get the regulator to actually adopt very quickly because digital is actually far? How do you also, I think you have mentioned as well, how do you gain trust and trust across the plan, across all the stakeholders? It's trusting the, um, getting trust from the regulator, getting trust from customers as well to switch from how they've been transitioned traditionally safely doing their things to something that would benefit them. And you actually have to show them. So education is actually a key part. And how do you, how do you integrate education into that, into that, into that, into that whole, into that whole package? And, but for the biggest one too, is also culture as well. I mean, culture cuts across education. So that education means like you have to like, so like in Nigeria, for example, it's how are we, are we going to leverage up digital to educate people in four major languages with different, um, cultural um, um, 
uh, consideration when it comes to whether you're uh, whether you're atheist, um, Muslim, or Christian. So, uh, so those are things that those, those those are things that we think about every day and thinking, okay, which one do you actually prioritize, and which, where are you going to get your biggest um, bang for, for for your buck for the resources that you deploy. So that's what we're battling. But I think digital is also helping us do. I mean, and we can talk about it much later. How we're trying to use the new technologies to break through these uh, these challenges. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, Stone, how about how about you? Yeah, uh, so it so happens that we are pretty much all trying to do the same thing, bring financial services uh, to people on the continent and uh, also off of the continent around the world. And uh, in, indeed, um, we pretty much have uh, the, the, the same challenge. So in addition to uh, what um, Gozi and uh, Uzoma mentioned, uh, I think uh, still the same problem, but I'm going to be more specific and, and go around regulation. That's a, a massive, massive problem. Uh, our startup is quite different uh, from um, Carbon and Sparkle because um, we, we started from day one with a multi-country, multi-currency approach, uh, whereas um, these uh, other guys are kind of built deeply within one market, capture a, substan a substantial uh, volume and then uh, move into other markets. So we started tackling the problems uh, that they are tackling from day one, which makes uh, your, your journey extremely difficult when you have to tackle all those challenges across different markets. So we are operating in Uganda, in Kenya, in uh, Nigeria. We are looking at going into Ghana as well. Uh, Tanzania, Rwanda, and so that makes uh, that uh, creates a, a massive issue around culture, uh, trust. Like uh, they mentioned, every country is different, so you have to localize your platform. Uh, but uh, even beyond that, is that in all these places you have uh, different uh, regulatory regimes, and that is extremely painful uh, when you have to deal with um, uh, multiple uh, regulators who may not necessarily understand what you're trying to solve or what uh, problems uh, you're coming in. So I think uh, the regulatory issue is, uh, is a real big one and extremely different across the continent. You have some regulators you'll talk to and you know they'll give you a reply six months later. You have some that you'll talk to and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll say, can you fly into uh, this city and, and we meet next week? Um, so, it's, uh, it's crazy like that. I think the other challenge that I see that is a massive, massive challenge across the continent in terms of financial services uh, is um, the lack of infrastructure. So um, some guys in Europe who are building, you know, in Europe, you might go to, to Mambu or Solaris or any of these companies and they'll give you a platform and then you build on top of that. You could have your digital uh, banking alternative in, in, in you know, in three or four months um, by building on top of a platform that is already uh, well built where you can issue cards, uh, do transfers, uh, issue IBANs and everything. In Africa, it's a whole different story. So there's no infrastructure. You basically have to build these. You have to go to Natalie and say, hey, can we plug into EcoCash? And then you have to go into Uganda and talk to MTN, and then you have to talk to a bank, and then you have to go to Nigeria and talk to um, uh, uh, somebody who's going to help you plug into NIBS. And that's a massive, massive nightmare. So we've had to build infrastructure as we also build the app. It's like three times more difficult to build on the continent than it is to build in Europe. Uh, but yeah, those are some of the challenges that we're facing. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. And um, Nat, I don't know if you, if you, um... I think you may have had a slight internet hiccup there while you were talking, and I kind of missed the part that you said you, you were talking about regulation yourself. I'm just wondering if you could um, uh, give us a little bit more idea about your 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 take on regulation. Uh, Th thanks, thanks, Chris. I'm sorry that I'm having a storm uh, in Harare. It's, it's a massively raging one with thunderstorms, thunderstorms and all. Hopefully, this will hold up. But I think our biggest issue is that we're now a monopoly leader and a market leader, bigger than all banks put together. And the regulator uh, really would like to demonopolize the environment. And that's been our single biggest challenge. And like uh, um, Stone and uh, Uzoma and Ghazi 
have talked about regulation in Africa, it is a really, really difficult space. First of all, digitization that we're dealing with is nascent um, in its, in its uh, life cycle development. And so there is isn't great understanding and exposure on it. Some regulators know what they're doing, some regulators don't know what they're doing, which makes it all the more complex. But I do think, you know, all tech businesses globally are facing real issues with regulation. And it's how do you think about reg tech and reg innovation so that you're thinking about it with the end in sight so that it, you actually don't kill the baby and the bathwater. And I personally think the worst thing that could happen is when regulators are on the wrong side of innovation. And that is predominantly true on the African continent. And yet there's so many opportunities, particularly with the mobile cell phone, where you have more cell phone devices than you have toothbrushes. You have, and so that has enabled actually uh, users to, 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 to leapfrog and highest a penetration of internet connectivity which has really made the difference, but the regulations got to catch up uh, with the innovation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I, I completely agree. And I actually think that it's, it, you've all highlighted the fact that it's kind of a, it's, a, it's a real issue. I think it's not just an issue in Africa. Actually, I even worked on something like this for the European Commission at one point a few years ago, trying to understand the role. And I guess the part, the deal with regulation is it's normally set up to do it once, you know, and then wait, and then for 50 years, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's kind of regulation isn't, isn't quick to respond right now, you know, in that sense. And it's, so I, I feel for you when you're trying to move across borders and you're trying to change jurisdictions and you've got to deal with different regulate regulatory regimes. So that combined with culture sounds like those are your, those are the two biggest um, frictions and right now for, for your pan-continent um, expansion somehow. Um, let me ask you if you have any questions for each other before we open it up to the audience, or if you have anything else that you would like to discuss uh, at this point. Yes, Stone, can we build on your infrastructure since you've taken all the pain already? <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure, definitely, <laughs> definitely. So I, I, my question to Stone, I, I'm going to ask Stone. I mean, like, I mean, to, I mean, to start going across countries and you, you're looking at different, different currencies, different regulators. I mean, what, what concerns do you have now with, with COVID now and people locking down and people looking more inwards now? Is that helping? I know that COVID is helping people look at digital, but it's also it's also driving people to look more inwards into their own countries instead of looking outwardly anymore. So how, how are that? impacted your business? Yeah, um, I think what we see is um, um, Africans, I don't know, it's probably all people around the world. Uh, Africans are generally very mobile. Like we move, we move uh, a lot. Uh, there's some, so just a few key reasons why uh, we decided to focus on uh, multi-country and multi-currency multi um, play from the very beginning is that uh, we looked at the problem of cross-border money transfer as the initial problem that we were trying to solve. And uh, we realized that uh, there's amazing ways to send money from, uh, you know, from London and New York and, 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 and basically Europe and North America. Uh, it takes you, I mean, seconds to jump onto TransferWise and push that money to, to, to Nigeria or to Ghana. But we looked at some numbers and then uh, this problem became interesting when we realized that um, about 43% of the money that goes into Africa, uh, that is received into African countries cross-border is actually coming from other African countries. And we also realized that there was no, uh, there was basically nobody using technology to try and solve this problem uh, when we started thinking about uh, uh, the problem. So we said, uh, uh, if we are going to do, you know, cross-border as, um, if we're going to solve this, the problem of cross-border money transfers as uh, the first thing that we do, then we definitely need to be in multiple places uh, from uh, day one. And we also need to uh, be multi-currency. So that was uh, the thinking, you know, looking at 70% uh, of Africans leaving their countries are actually moving into other African countries which is uh, super interesting numbers. And so we looked at the problem, the problem is big and we say, hey, let's solve this problem. But then that also makes it um, much more difficult uh, to, to solve. So with 
COVID, what I was going to say with all this background uh, is that uh, all these people that are moving around and uh, all these people that uh, need to move money across borders um, still have that need. So the need is there. It's, uh, it's a massive, massive problem across the continent. Obviously, there's tons of challenges uh, around that. Uh, but what we see in the market is that um, the, the need for the service is there. So then the next thing is how do you deal with uh, whatever challenges that come your way, you know, currency regulators. Nigeria is a very interesting um, uh, country right now because of the uh, different uh, rates in terms of uh, Forex, where it's, it's crazy because, you know, you can collect $5 million worth of Naira and to, uh, it's worth 0.2, you know? So there is some serious problems. I'm hard to look um, to okay. do you do you do you collect this Nigerian naira and buy uh, buy Bitcoin or some cryptocurrency? Is it more stable? Is it going to grow while the naira goes down? Uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, almost everybody who's working tech, um, I think, even together with you guys, uh, is actually facing. Yeah, but we do have to find solutions. The problem is there. We just came and said, let's solve this problem. It's more difficult how we've done it. It's just how it is. Hmm. Fine. Um, let's take a couple of questions from the audience. And if you have anything else that you want to ask each other, just, just, you know, just go ahead and, and signal. Um, but here we have a question about um, Moja Loop. And um, Moja Loop is an open source software for payment interoperability. And so the question is, is Moja Loop project going to help the Pan-African payment connectivity? Anybody want to comment on that? Maybe I can take that one. That is from the Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation. We have personally made an assessment of it and we don't necessarily believe that it's going to drive the market scale uh, that, uh, that is required uh, for Africa. But there are a lot of uh, open platforms, initiatives that are being built right now uh, on the base, on the backdrop of the um, Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement. My personal belief is that it should be driven by market leaders. So the kind of work that uh, Stone Atwina is doing, setting up um, private market platforms. You've also got um, the likes of uh, MFS Africa who are building similar platforms. It's really about replicating uh, what incumbent firms like Visa and MasterCard have been able to do, in my view, uh, and building ecosystems as opposed to actually driving it from a policy angle, which is where I think it is coming from. So that is my personal view. And the, there is, you know, seeds of the spirit that I've started on the continent in terms of building interoperable platforms. Telcos are coming together and trying to build these ecosystems banks coming together trying to build these ecosystems mm. personally believe that it is a matter of time uh and it okay um you just went on mute um but um thank you very much for that uh intervention i i, I forgot to mention this was by drago indic uh in london this question and uh jay wiza says that if they can implement it and agree to it then he thinks he or she thinks that it's yes it will help, but uh, he says, that, or she says, the challenge is not technical. Um, here's another question that was upvoted a lot right now, which is, do any of the panelists look to reach the unbanked who may not have access to smartphones and internet? Yeah, anyone? <laughs> I'll go, I'll, I'll just go ahead and take that. So when we started out, one of our main uh, things that we wanted to do, you know, was to uh, build our platform on uh, USSD as well, which is basically making, making it available on uh, the $10 phone um, that can be used by anybody who might not have access to, to a smartphone. Um, <laughs> to be honest, we were quickly punched in the face. This is something that we would like to do, but uh, again, Looking at the market, uh, especially in East Africa, I think Nigeria might be different, uh, or in West Africa it might be different because there's some uh, regulatory play there. But we found that 
uh, the telecommunication companies would possibly charge you more um, to run the USSD session than any money you would ever make from a customer. So this is something that, uh, in my opinion, can you know we can play around with. We've done it in Uganda where you can access some of our services through USSD. Uh, but I think from a cost angle, this is something that can really be done uh, by telecommunication companies. Because of all these learnings, we, 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 again, we made a cautious decision that it, was, it just didn't make sense for us to try and compete with telecommunication companies for services. So uh, our new angle is how do we provide the infrastructure uh, on top of providing it to uh, Ngozi, also provide it to you know, Natalie and EcoCash so that um, uh, Natalie's customers can make that transfer to uh, other uh, mobile money platform or a bank account in Europe or something like that. So that's the thinking uh, uh, on top of this. Number two, and just, just being super honest, is that uh, when you think about um, the financial, just fundamentally, if you look at the finances, uh, the people, Natalie may disagree with this, the, 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 the people that you're targeting with USSD are for us, um, their average revenue per user um, just does not justify, so ju does not justify trying to provide uh, that solution in terms of acquiring that customer. Again, the telecommunication company has a massive, massive advantage because they already have this customer. So uh, they are yeah. not, you know, trying to bleed scale to 20 million people. It's people that they already have. So for us to go out there and try to reach those people through USSD on a separate platform, it basically will never make uh, financial sense for us. So while this is something that we would like to do, I mean, we started out, it's even on our website, if you look at everson.co, you will see that $10 form. Uh, but we quickly did the numbers and, 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 and for us as a company, it just doesn't make sense. On top of that, we think, uh, we see that uh, smartphone adoption is, is, is accelerating across the continent. Uh, we see new OSs uh, like KaiOS uh, that are super interesting. Maybe you can build for that. Um, we see that uh, the cost of the internet uh, is, is going down. So then the other question that comes up on top of all the cost considerations is, does it make sense to build uh, for a massive, massive market that is actually dwindling, that is reducing, because right. a lot of people are adopting uh, cell phones. Can right. you build fast enough um, to create real impact for USSD uh, if, for example, in three, four, five years, uh, a massive, massive percentage of the market will have smartphones? Yes, thanks. Um, I kind of disagree with that, uh, you know, but maybe because, you know, we're born out of a, of a telco operator. And obviously we run our platform uh, on, on the network, but we've actually been able to do things differently for startup uh, players. We've offered APIs where they actually build the menus on our USSD. So we're actually paying because we are doing the hosting. And I think this is, it is important for banks and telco operators to facilitate for that. And I, Stone at the beginning of this was saying, you know, he's had a hard time going to the likes of us, the eco-caches, telco operators and banks and saying, hey, hey, can you host me? But, you know, you got to do this country to country. And I think this is something that um, fintechs and new startup codes have to push for. It, it is quite difficult if you're not an incumbent and if you don't hold sort of like um, the customer base. Uh, we've also seen that 80% of our transactions remain on USSD, even though we have a smartphone offering, simply because when you have connectivity uh, disparity across the country uh, on 2G and 3G, you can have a really good experience as opposed to intermittent, uh, intermittent um, connectivity sometimes on LTE. It may not be as good and it's expensive to roll out in the rural areas. So my view is that the ability to negotiate with telco operators is important and telcos have to change and host on be behalf of new fintechs. Great. Yeah. That's exactly uh, the, 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 that's exactly the, the, the gameplay that I think works, but not us trying to build, you know, USSD channels right. by ourselves. We have to get onto your menu. Then things get really interesting. Then we have 20 million customers overnight. Yep. 
<laughs> okay. Um, let's move on to. You need to have good coffee with the telco operators. Boil oh, yeah. them a little bit. Let, Look, let's we, let's hear from uh, Uzoma. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, you know, like I believe strongly believe that the future of Africa is digital, and I think that late digital infrastructure is a, as important as building roads. So first of all, we need a very strong mindset because I don't think that we can we can grow as a continent using on a USSD infrastructure. It, it has its constraints. It's like a branch network. And so we have to look at it from a different perspective. Now, you know, trust is very, very key. And before we even go to the unbanked, there's a reason why people are unbanked, because infrastructure is not there. And so before you are even banked, you have to feed, you have to have health, you have to have all that. And it is based on identity. And so now we even have, so in Nigeria, we have 200 million people, we have multiple identification. So on any platform is how do you trust people? So before, so for us, the only way to do it is digital. And we've seen a lot of investment in digital and um, India is a very good example where USSD is not a solution because they have internet, um, internet access everywhere. So it means now that all the stakeholders, government, private sector, fintech, traditional banks, can use that new platform, right, to now educate people, get get identity, include people socially before you start thinking of how to actually get them to open bank account. Because as far as I'm concerned, you can't a bank account is of no interest to me if you know I don't have good health or I don't have education. And education is actually actually needed to build trust and to get people uh, get people to be able to sustain themselves. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Ngozi, did you have one last comment on I thought I saw you may have turned off your, you turned on your microphone a couple times there. <laughs> no, look, I think, I think, um, all has been said, so, uh, good to okay. move on. <laughs> Great. That, by the way, that was from Ike. Uh, Chris, I don't know. I mean, I like this debate and maybe I just need to add something, but actually yeah. when you look at the, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs in Africa, it is a little bit different for some people. They're actually quite happy to have a bundle of internet and speak on WhatsApp before they have healthcare. It, 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 it varies. It, the priorities of what people want are, are not as, as complex as some developed markets. And we've been able to grow our business on the basis of that. Mm. The fact that um, someone wants to uh, just buy airtime, and if there's a good incentive on a platform, you know, that, that could be much more important uh, that, than having health ha healthcare. Africa is largely a dollar a day market. It's largely prepaid. If somebody can eat their way through a day and, you know, buy those tomatoes, sell whatever they sell, you know, a day and prepay their way to life, it is predominantly that kind of model. So I, I kind of disagree with that because I have found that at least in our country in Zimbabwe and mostly Southern Africa, the priorities are very different. Mm. To my point, people have more cell phones than they would prioritize a toothbrush. <laughs> That's not such a bad thing. Communication yeah. is more important for them. Yeah. And, and these are some of the numbers that we've sort of taken a look at. And in this COVID-19 pandemic, we found that education acceleration was much higher in our country because we were able to disseminate on mobile cell phones and people had these devices. And so it was actually an advantage as opposed to ability to, to have healthcare or healthcare insurance, uh, for instance. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, by the way, that was that was the question from Ik Chuku Uche. Um, now we have a couple questions here about regulation. Just to get back to the regulation discussion that we had, um, the first one I'll just read them both. So that way we can you can you know comment on whatever part of it you like. Um, the first one from uh, Rushab Mehta. He says, "What exactly are regulators attempting to control? For example, in Ethiopia, only banks can handle mobile banking. Is that something that regulators are pushing for?" and what differs between the regulation in different markets. And the second question is from uh, SP, and it says, is there a country that seems to have a better approach to regulation or a more favorable environment to develop for mobile banking? Any, any takers there? Yeah. Do you wanna you go know, first? I mean, just, <laughs> no, go ahead, yeah, please go ahead. No, I was asking if uh, somebody else wants to take it. Yeah. So do it. Go for it. I, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I can't speak to, um, I can't speak to Ethiopia, um, but in terms of regulation in different markets. So, like I said, we, we, we have tried to get licenses in, in you know, where we've got licenses in Ghana, 
one in Nigeria, and we're just about to finalize one in one in Kenya. And, and the truth is that the different ecosystems dictate, you know, the, the behavior of the regulator. Um, if you look at Kenya, you have, you know, a regulator that allowed, um, you know, the financial um, retail finance to be dominated by telcos. The Nigerian regulator has has sworn that this will never happen in Nigeria, right? Um, Ghana is probably, you know, somewhere in the middle where you, you have a nice balance between you know, the, the penetration of mobile money, you know, whilst the banks are, are, are still there. So, so, so I think the, I, I know this Stone alluded to that point is, I think different regulators are good for different things. You know, in Nigeria, you have actually you have a fantastic payment system. You know, they focus on that. They've said, we don't want mobile money, or at least we don't want telco-led mobile money. But, you know, quite frankly, there, there's almost little need for mobile money, at least for the general population, unless you want to go into the um, unbanked. Because P2P transfers have been, yeah, yeah, they're very, they're, they're low cost, you know, it's very, whether it's via USSD, the banks have actually been very nimble in, in, in many cases. Um, I think one, one thing that we haven't seen and across all markets is the, the real adoption of regulatory sandboxes that will allow, you know, com you know companies here to say, okay, we're, we're not sure about cryptocurrency, for example, but hey, we'll allow X number of companies to, to try it out um, with our blessing and see if it can actually truly have um, an, an impact in, to the ecosystem. I, I think only Egypt is the country where we've seen um, the regulator actually walk the, um, walk the talk. Um, beyond that, I think there's been a lot of work with you know, the likes of the World Bank, I actually working with different regulators, but not much has been seen, um, mm -hmm. at least from us as operators in, in plugging into the, the system and you know, going, going on the edge to see what can be done. Yeah. Oh, but by the way, I, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier. <laughs> um, USSD, for those of you who don't know, is it's kind of like a SMS message. It's 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 a non-data channel use of the telecommunications that people use for financial transactions. So just in case you were wondering what what USSD is all, all around, uh, that's that's what it is. Um, any other comments about cross-country regulations? Yeah, Nat. Yeah, just to I think. Uh, but that's what Angozi said, like spot on in the countries, you're absolutely right. I was going to repeat the same countries as well, what you said, so I'm belabor on that. But I think there are two other things that we that really pressurizes regulators. It becomes a political economy issue. Uh, market control and market concentration issues can actually become a risk to state security. And I think the lack of understanding on these fintechs and um, uh, new technologies and uh, aspects on uh, cybersecurity um, actually do threaten regulators, traditional regulators who don't know how to deal with this thing. So I think it transcends um, the innovative benefits. And most regulators really actually start to think about what does it mean for monetary policy and monetary supply? What does it start to mean about uh, um, liquidity holdings? If yeah. they're held, in, fit, in fintechs and they're not held uh, within uh, central banks. Kenya has been easier because Safaricom is owned by the government. Mm. That's why that has been different because it is actually sitting within the state. Go to any other place where it is not a government led telco operator, there are big issues uh, once you start to scale. Uh, and, and so I think those, those dynamics around market concentration really have to be thought about uh, through and through. And then we have to start looking at aspects like uh, interoperability right at the beginning, uh, so that you're actually covering for market concentration and then making sure it doesn't become a political economy risk. Yes, yes. Yes, Ozoma, another comment? I'm like, I'm like, I mean, the regulator today probably has a more difficult job than he had 20 years ago. And you know, if you're, sure. if you're saddled with the responsibility of trust and stability you know it means especially because first of all you're dealing with people's current monies so like i always say like no matter how you know creative and innovative we are as financial services we are actually we have a fiduciary responsibility we're taking people's money and we're saving them and if that trust is broken then you'll have stability issues now with all these different solutions innovative solutions that are being thrown at them it's which one is going to, which one is priority, which one is going to scale, which one is going to cause the least disruption. 
um, in the market. And so like it's a very, and so that's where a lot of, and so like what, 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 is, the, what is the solution? It's advocacy, it's education. And especially in Central Bank where they're probably not learning as fast or absorbing as fast as you know, um, uh, private sector companies who, whose job is, it, it is to, to, you know, to be dynamic, to be very flexible, while the central bank regulates us to, be, to create stability, to ensure trust, to yeah. test and learn before you know, they allow something out there. And then when you have lots of solutions being provided at you, it becomes, it becomes an issue. So there needs to be, so like there needs to be a bit of understanding and knowing that this is, this is something that is not going to really go away tomorrow. No, I, 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 I actually, you know, I think we should, we should agree that regulation, in je regulation overall isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's good and bad regulations that make it more difficult to do things in, in um, digital banking, mobile banking, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, I mean, there are plenty of regulations that are actually good. Um, and sometimes it's a little easier in one place or another. They allow experimentation more or less. And that's the kind of thing that we're, that we're talking about here. Um, let me, let me move on to the next one, which is um, Stephen Caleb Katurebe says, can any panelists talk about the place of NFC near field communication in mobile payments and the future of it on the continent? That's not Ali. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I tried to build an NFC wallet while I was still in university in 2012. Very premature, uh, didn't take off. And when I took on this, uh, EcoCash here in Zimbabwe, we launched NFC uh, payment tags. I think maybe you might be able to see one at the back of my phone. Uh, it, yeah. And we do have, uh, you know, um, these, uh, it's like the Oyster card basically. And it's just not taken off yet in our market, but we continue to test. We're about to try it out on wearables. We'll see if it makes a difference. But I think the idea is iteration, uh, continuing to improve being ahead of the market and trying different kinds of things until you sort of hit the sweet spot. But I must say, you know, twice now, failed heavily, but I think the, 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 the quicker, the sooner you fail, the better you get to your best set um, innovation. So uh, there's room for it, but yeah, I think it's gonna take time. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so there, I mean, like, I mean, in my last life, I mean, like, well, I mean, like similar to what Natalie said, we, have, we, we, we piloted the, uh, uh, we piloted the uh, NFC um, initiative with a company um, that was driving out the market. But the problem with that is that you actually have to build the market as well. So it means that if the, if the existing competing um, solutions it's, to scale is going to be an issue. Now, I think one of the things that um, the, um, the regulators has, has said in Nigeria is that all cards that are produced from 2020 have to be NFC enabled. So that means so that is the, so that is the regulator actually now trying to help build that market. The second bit about what we need now are common standards. Those common standards will allow us right to now for anyone who wants to play in that NF NFC field, whether it's their mobile phone, whether it's their cars, or whether it's their point of sale term terminals, so things can start talking to each other. And when that does happen, that's where you're going to see um, it's actually quite needed, but you're going to free the reduction in the cost of payments and you're also going to see a more adoption of digital and electronic ways uh, way of making payments. And we already have, so for example, we have, we have a, 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 a road that is also had NFC enabled payments. So it's just actually using, for example, using that, the, the same common standards to now build that. Because if I knew what the, stand, the standards were, I'll enable my chips, my, my cards, right, to, to, to do that. So that would just reduce the cost of doing that. But it's definitely going to be there because the cost of uh, point of sale terminals, especially in Nigeria is very, very expensive because you have to import these things. And so where I also see a big opportunity, not NFC, but also um, QR codes, where you don't actually, everybody has a smartphone, a QR code is very, very low cost a payment solution and then anybody can hang it around their neck and then accept payments. So that's where I see opportunities with NFC, QR codes, big opportunities in Africa. Yeah, thanks. I, I think, you know, you're right in the sense that, um, you know, NFC requires a kind of complementary technology that everyone has to adopt somehow. And, you know, the, the QR code is a little simpler because there it's just, a, it's, it's, it's low tech solution that enables you with, you know, connect with your, with your phone. Um, let me launch a second poll now, since we're 
I think this is a very, since you've set us off on this, um, Uzoma, on this topic, um, I'm going to launch another poll here for you to look at. And this is the, um, do we have much further to go in digitally transforming the financial services sector? So, you know, the first one is, I expect we've hardly seen the beginning. There's lots more to come. The second one is ho-hum. We've made a lot of progress, but it's diminishing returns from here on out. And the third one is, Digital transformation has definitely jumped the shark and at this point is old news. So what do you think? <laughs> Another couple seconds here. <laughs> Okay, I think that's everybody who's got an opinion. Let's share the results here. 93%. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's a, of course, you know, you're self-selected to, to, to come to this panel. But anyways, 93% um, <laughs> think that we hardly seen the beginning. Uh, of course, that's where I am. And then we have a few, two or three uh, people in the audience who are um, dubious about it. Um, at this point, whether or not it will actually pay off. Any reactions from the panel for that, um, for that little poll before we move on to the next question? Well, I will say I definitely agree. Uh, first of all, we haven't seen any disintimidation in the financial services sector, and that's what digital is actually going to do. I mean, for us at Sparkle, I mean, like we see ourselves as a platform and not financial services, because in the end, um, I mean, like you, people are going to be um, accessing services from, from different platforms, and and I think the regulate regulation is going to move not regulating whether you're a commercial bank, but regulating what the activities that you actually do. So you probably have a mom and pop shop that says, you know, I want to go into into forex forex trading. So they have to get a license, they have to pay the, put the capital aside, and that's what's really going to happen. So we have to be open for that because what digital is going to do is going to reduce the barriers of entry and increase transparency and trust, which means that. Anybody can jump in. All you have to do is make a capital and prove that you are capable of doing that business. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, that, that's a very good uh, segue into the next question from Mag, who says, which financial service has been most adopted in Africa for transactions uh, that a digital market business can partner with? So which financial service has been most adopted in Africa for transactions that a digital market business par can partner with? My experience has been that aggregators like Cellulent are doing an incredible job by actually building platforms. Again, we come back to platforms where they're um, providing an ability for all manner of payments. And so that comes from uh, bank payments, uh, whether you're buying by airtime, whether it's, it's mobile money and enabling uh, merchant payments or merchant commerce. And I think that is in the future of transactions going to be actually huge. And we can take cues from that for um, the, the, the trade platforms and the ambitions of the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement, if you ask me. So I think e-commerce is going to benefit, but my view is that it's going to be the conveners of the platforms that will actually be able to facilitate for this. Mm, great. Um, <laughs> I yeah. think just, I think it's also like when I look at it from a, a bankers working in a banking banking environment for many years. I think it's, 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 it's savings and deposits. So we've seen a lot of of um, financial institutions partner with, for example, like I remember like people like Conga and Jumia. What, what do they have? They have wallets. So everybody has a wallet store because they because, because if I can hold, get hold of the customer's money, then it means that the, the probability of him actually shopping with me is going to be so much higher. So um, first of all, you start with a client as a you start you start with a, with a, with a, with, a, with a company as a client. Then you're you're collaborating together, and the next minute you're actually competing for customers' deposits as well because they want that they, they want to reduce their own cost of doing business and get some spontaneous finances. So that is one area I think that has been hit hard, and and the regulation to hold those deposits are next to nothing. So that so that's where I've seen a lot of color collaboration. Yeah. Um. Here, here's one, um, uh, uh, Che Dozi Hez 
says, um, a very informative session. Is there any plan to consolidate effort in these ecosystems to free up bandwidth for innovation, which the continent greatly requires right now? Is there any plan um, to consolidate effort in these ecosystems? Yeah, um, let me, uh, I don't know. Uh, the, the answer is, uh, I don't know if there's plans, but uh, I have an opinion and I think uh, the problems we're trying to solve are really massive, massive, massive problems. There's no one who can, you know, solve these problems uh, by themselves. And um, we've got different um, uh, skills and expertise. So, for example, I know how to move money across borders. Uh, Ngozi knows how to, you know, give digital loans and and so on and so forth. So uh, instead of... Um, carbon building, you know, um, cross-border uh, 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 solutions, they can plug into our own thing and then we can plug into theirs uh, to offer those uh, digital loans and then we can run much faster together and, and you know, um, support people. I think there's more success uh, uh, to be uh, gotten out of, uh, uh, as, you know, a group of um, financial technology startups working together plug into you know, mobile network operators and banks, some of the banks that are more forward looking. I see this in Nigeria, for example, where some of the financial uh, technology startups are, 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 are doing uh, deposit mobilization for banks. Um, the bank is willing to let us uh, you know, plug into their platforms as long as we give them deposits. So um, I think there's a massive need for us to do this. Uh, but there's also a massive problem with most of the innovators is that everybody thinks wants to solve all the problems by themselves. Um, so I think it takes very special effort and special thinking uh, outside the box to actually come to that conclusion that I will work with somebody that I'm looking at as, as, as competition today uh uh tomorrow so we can work together to solve um uh, the problem because i think the problem is really 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 too big for any of us to even begin um to solve by uh by ourselves great thanks ngozi do you have a um, comment on this or um i mean i, I couldn't agree more i, I think well, i think the, the challenges are huge you know it, it takes it takes humility to appreciate that I can't do it all. And I, I don't think there's enough of that. And mm -hmm. when I look at digital, digital banking, I think we all end up in the same place. I, I mean, as Carbon, we started out as a vendor. And I think every, literally every other thing that we've added onto our platform, whether it's P2P transfers, savings, um, payments, we've actually tried to partner with a, another party instead. Um, because we, we, you know, for us, we, we're, we're invested in lending. It was easier, we thought, to bring other people in so we've either, we built it eventually, but only because either we couldn't buy or there was no, there was no trust. Um, and I think it goes beyond the, um, the product itself. It's also the market. You know, there's, you know, in Nigeria, we have two, 200 million adults, right? Or 100, 100 million adults. The truth of the matter though, is that maybe 4 million, right? Are potential customers of, of, of stones. And so as a result, if you want to be that massive company, you then have to go to Ghana, to go to Rwanda, go to Kenya, et cetera. And you can't do that, you know, on your own. You really have to make sure that, look, who are the partners I can plug in with? Um, and not just other fintechs, but other you know, people in the real sector. And I, and I think that's the opportunity that a lot of us are missing, is that we need to make this relevant. You know, we, you know, I think Nachi talked about, um, you know, Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, you know, we believe insurance is underpenetrated, but nobody wants to pay for car insurance and drive your car safely. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, so what have we done? We, we've said we will give people health insurance, or at least hospital cash insurance, free, as long as you save a certain amount of money with us, right? As you're saving with us, you're reducing our cost of funds, you know? Mm. So, so I think there are huge opportunities in making these things relevant to to, to the, the wider community. And, and I think it, it changes, you know? So if you ask somebody, do you want to buy um, life insurance? They say no. But if you say, do you want to buy a product whereby, you know, you send your mother money every month, if something happens to you, she will keep getting those 
um, receipts, she will, say, she will say, yes, I definitely want that. So, so a lot of it is also making it relevant to the individuals. Um, but but still, but the collaboration is, is critical and everyone has to play a part. So, you know, in Nigeria, the telcos, you know, you want to innovate with them. They say, this is great. I love the idea. I'll take 85% of the revenues. You take 15. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what you're spending. And, and it's actually counterintuitive. But if you flip it, the amount of innovation and people that you will, co will come will, will skyrocket the, the level of innovation that's taking place. Great. Um, I, we're, we're supposed to be finishing up pretty soon. So I think we maybe we'll stick on for a few more minutes, but basically we should probably try and wrap up a little. I was thinking since we have a lot of questions here, um, we could just do a quick lightning round. Okay, so I'll just throw out a question and maybe one person can give a very concise response to the question. Okay, uh, first one is from Wiza saying, um, uh, you know, how can fintechs approach USSD infrastructure in markets with restrictive regulation? For example, in Uganda, obtaining a USSD short code certificate will cost $10,000 per year. Is it worth lobbying for regulatory change continent wide? Anybody have a quick, a quick reaction to that? Yes, uh, it's worth it. But uh, for now, I don't know the, our our thinking is just don't 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 do USSD. Okay, um, let me go to the next one. Do the panelists consider cryptocurrency as complementary or competition to their technology for transactions or remittances or other services? That's from um, that's from Ike Chuku Uche. Um, anybody have a quick uh, reaction to that one? Stone. <laughs> yeah, I think um, like I think it's Gozi who mentioned uh, previously. At the end of the day, we are all going to look the same way. Sparkle, uh, you know, carbon ever send. Uh, it's going to be that little bottom thing with your balance here, with send money, with uh, virtual card, uh, with crypto and stock investments there, and and bill payments. That's what it is. Uh, I think. Uh, crypto uh, is solving serious problems in some markets where you know you have some uh, currency restrictions right now. It's definitely uh, not competition. I think uh, it plays in. Good. Um, thanks. Uh, here's one um, from former student Adewole Adedeji. Um, what are great businesses such as yours doing to build financial inclusion for bottom of the pyramid people as a core development imperative in Africa's digitization strategy? I'll take that one. I think we started off as a uh, mobile money platform. Uh, three years later, we built on insurance and we're the largest micro insurance provider uh, in our country. Another two years later, we've built up e-commerce and just last year, we uh, launched logistics via mobil uh, a mobility platform. So I think what we're really trying to do is entrench an ecosystem. So the payment side business has become a platform, but we want to be able to offer other um, value-added services on top of that uh, healthcare. In COVID, we've given a free COVID insurance uh, so that you know we can help uh, those that are our customers to actually go through this pandemic um, more, in a much better way. So it's those kinds of uh, interventions that we're trying to build on through a fine, deepening financial inclusion. Great. Um, let me, uh, I think we better more, more I mean, I'd, I'd love to keep going on the questions. Maybe we'll have a look at the questions for, and we'll try and respond in writing to any those of you that we didn't make it to. We still have at least five more questions there, um, <laughs> which is very nice. Thank you very much for all your questions, guys. It's, it's, it's been great. Uh, but I want to kind of conclude here, wrap it up a little bit, get the point of view of the panel on what the job market is like for highly qualified African graduates looking to work in your respective countries. So what are the opportunities, any advice that you could give? Um, what could you and Imperial College actually um, as an institution and a community do uh, to help support the next generation of African students and recent graduates? Um, it's kind of like an imperial enterprise lab where we're taking technology, trying to commercialize technology. But I, you may have other, you may have other thoughts or ideas as well. So I just wanted to kind of wrap up with this kind of gen general question. I'm sure if you ask any of us, you know, one of the big obstacles to our growth is people. It's people and and it's it's that knowledge. And 
there's so much that can be done. Um, so we're always constantly uh, on the look for talent. I think one of the issues that we, we have is that the, you know, the people that are coming, say, from the West uh, are demanding, you know, wages that are not, at least not now commensurate with, with what we can afford unless you're, you're in for the long term. So, you know, you come and you say, okay, I need to have a dollar salary or a sterling salary. That's, that, you know, we earn in local currency. That's already um, cancelled. But, but to the extent that there, there, there are people with relevant skills or the, the interest, I, I think in all our companies, there's a home. Um, if you're willing to be aligned with the company in eating when we're eating, crying when we're crying. I think there's real synergies. We could probably develop, I like the idea of an Africa lab. There is the Breven Howard Institute that's just been launched at Imperial. Every time I'm in London, I visit and are we actually collaborating with uh, the Winners Project uh, that is building machine learning, satellite data into insurance. And we're, to, with that team in Imperial, we're actually planning on launching something in Tanzania. We have launched something with them through the Africa Development Bank here. And it was such a sense of pride to have really talented team from Imperial working on this for mm -hmm. us, for pharma loans, for uh, de-risking, uh, satellite sensitivity and all these really cool things. And I think there should be more of that. There's a lot to tap into. And I've, I've a, I have a practical example that I'm ever so proud of. Great. Zoma? Yeah. So, well, I think, you know, um, like I said, like I have a you know, that entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurship is going to be very, very key because, you know, as organizations, whether it's fintechs or whether it's whole businesses, as people begin to leverage on digital and businesses transform and the future of work, it means that even existing new old companies, are going to, existing companies are going to have to have entrepreneurial people, mindsets, right, to actually transform their companies, right, and change the way they do things and start looking at themselves as new fintechs within tra traditional organizations or, or tech um, fintech type, type companies. So that's where going to be very, very key. So it's not just the functional perspective, but it's that mindset that's going to be key and being able to be flexible, dynamic, um, to looking at remote, smart working, those are going to come into play um, um, going forward. Fine. Stone, last? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably not, not much to add. Uh, if you're flexible and dynamic, like Ozoma says, just uh, write to any of the founders and say, hey, I've checked out this company and this is what I can do. We are always, always looking for talent. It's probably an even bigger problem than regulation at this point uh, for us at Eversend and I guess uh, for many other people. So uh, we are very happy to uh, chat uh, with anyone who is willing to, to, to get their hands dirty. <laughs> Great. Please don't, don't write to Nat. I heard her revenue numbers. She doesn't need help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love a collaboration, Gozi, just saying. So I'm going to reach out after this. <laughs> All right, collaboration is good. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much, guys. It's been really uh, stimulating. And I, I think um, I've learned a lot. I think the participants, we've had, you know, 50, 60, 70 people on board um, uh, participating in this. Lots and lots of questions uh interaction so let me thank you uh once again and i would like to turn it back now to nicola to um to conclude our session tonight uh thank you very much chris i mean that was such a fabulous uh discussion and debate everybody and uh made all the more so because we had such great questions so thank you to our audience as well and of course to chris because he's a he's a delight to to work with and uh we really he's such a great facilitator Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope it stimulated ideas for connections and uh, for getting together and uh, insights on what's happening on the continent. So uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>